Act One of The School for Wives by Moliere, translated by Henry van Laun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The School for Wives, a comedy in five acts, by Moliere. Dramatis Personae. Arnulf. Alias Monsieur de la Souche. Read by Peter Tucker. Footnote. This part was played by Moliere himself. End footnote. Cressald, friend to Arnulf. Read by Todd. Horace, in love with Agnes. Read by Thomas Peter. Enrique, brother in law of Cressald. Read by Chuck Williamson. Orant father to horace and a great friend of arnulf read by nemo alain a country fellow servant to arnulf read by alain mapstone the notary read by zames curran agnes a young innocent girl brought up by arnulf read by lian yao georgette a countrywoman servant to arnulf Read by Sonia. Narrated by Abai. Scene. A square in a town. Act One. Scene One. Grisald, Arnulf. You have come to marry her, you say? Yes, I mean to settle the business tomorrow. We are here alone, and I think we can speak together without fear of being overheard. Do you wish me to open my heart to you like a friend? Your plan makes me tremble with fear for you. To take a wife is a rash step for you, whichever way you consider the matter. True, my friend. Possibly you find in your own home reasons why you should fear for me. I fancy that your own forehead shows that horns are everywhere the infallible accompaniment of marriage. These are accidents against which we cannot insure ourselves. It seems to me that the trouble people take about this is very ridiculous. But when I fear for you, it is on account of this raillery of which a hundred poor husbands have felt the sting. For you know that neither great nor small have been safe from your criticism. That your greatest pleasure, wherever you are, is to make a mighty outcry about secret intrigues. Exactly. Is there another city in the world where husbands are so patient as here? Do we not meet with them in every variety and well provided with everything? One heaps up wealth, which his wife shares with those who are eager to make him a dupe. Another, slightly more fortunate, but not less infamous, sees his wife receive presents day after day, and is not troubled in mind by any jealous twinge when she tells him that they are the rewards of virtue. One makes a great noise, which does him not the slightest good, Another lets matters take their course in all meekness, and seeing the gallant arrive at his house, very politely takes up his gloves and his cloak. One married woman cunningly pretends to make a confidant of her confiding husband, who slumbers securely under such a delusion, and pities the gallant for his pains, which, however, the latter does not throw away. Another married woman, to account for her extravagance, says that the money she spends has been won at play and the silly husband without considering at what play thanks heaven for her winnings in short we find subjects for satire everywhere and may i as a spectator not laugh at them are not these fools yes but he who laughs at another must beware lest he in turn be laughed at himself i hear what is said and how some folks delight in retailing what goes on but no one has seen me exult at reports which are brooded about in the places I frequent. I am rather reserved in this respect, and though I might condemn a certain toleration of these matters, and am resolved by no means to suffer quietly what some husbands endure, yet I have never affected to say so. For, after all, satire may fall upon ourselves, and we should never vow in such cases what we should or should not do. Thus, if by an overruling fate some natural disgrace should ever happen to my brow i am almost sure after the way in which i have acted that people would be content to laugh at it in their sleeve 
and possibly, in addition, I may reap this advantage that a few good fellows will say, what a pity. But with you, my dear friend, it is otherwise. I tell you again, you are running a plaguy risk. As your tongue has always persistently bantered husbands accused of being tolerant, as you have shown yourself like a demon let loose upon them, you must walk straight for fear of being made a laughingstock. And, if it happens that they get the least pretext, take care they do not publish your disgrace at the public market cross, and... Good heaven, friend, do not trouble yourself. He will be a clever man who catches me in this way. I know all the cunning tricks and subtle devices which women use to deceive us, and how one is fooled by their dexterity, and I have taken precaution against this mischance. She whom I am marrying possesses all the innocence which may protect my forehead from evil influence. Why? What do you imagine? That a silly girl, to be brief? To marry a silly girl is not to become silly myself. I believe, as a good Christian, that your better half is very wise. But a clever wife is ominous, and I know what some people have to pay for choosing theirs with too much talent. What, I go and saddle myself with an intellectual woman, who talks of nothing but of her assembly and ruelle, who writes tender things in prose and in verse, and is visited by marquises and wits, whilst, as Mrs. So-and-so's husband, I should be like a saint whom no one calls upon. No, no, I will have none of your lofty minds. A woman who writes knows more than she ought to do. I intend that my wife shall not even be clever enough to know what a rhyme is. If one plays at Corbillon with her and asks her in her turn, what is put into the basket, I will have her answer, a cream tart. In a word, let her be very ignorant. And to tell you the plain truth, it is enough for her that she can say her prayers, love me, sew, and spin. A stupid wife, then, is your fancy? So much so that I should prefer a very stupid and ugly woman to a very beautiful one with a great deal of wit. Wit and beauty? Virtue is quite enough. But how can you expect, after all, that a mere simpleton can ever know what it is to be virtuous? Besides, to my mind, it must be very wearisome for a man to have a stupid creature perpetually with him. Do you think you act rightly, and that, by reliance on your plan, a man's brow is saved from danger? A woman of sense may fail in her duty, but she must at least do so knowingly. A stupid woman may at any time fail in hers without desiring or thinking of it. To this fine argument, this deep discourse, I reply as Pantagruel did to Panurge, urge me to marry any other woman than a stupid one. Preach and lecture till Whitsuntide, you shall be amazed to find, when you have done, that you have not persuaded me in the very slightest. I do not want to say another word. Every man has his own way. With my wife, as in everything, I mean to follow my fashion. I think I am rich enough to take a partner who shall owe all to me, and whose humble station and complete dependence cannot reproach me either with her poverty or her birth. A sweet and staid look made me love Agnès, amongst other children, when she was only four. It came into my mind to ask her from her mother, who was very poor, the good countrywoman, learning my wish, was delighted to rid herself of the charge. I had her brought up, according to my own notions, in a little solitary convent. That is to say, directing them what means to adopt in order to make her as idiotic as possible. Thank heaven, success has crowned my efforts, and I am very thankful to say I have found her so innocent that I have blessed heaven for having done what I wished, in giving me a wife according to my desire. Then I brought her away, and as my house is continually open to a hundred different people, and as we must be on our guard against everything, I have kept her in another house where no one comes to see me, and where her good disposition cannot be spoilt, as she meets none but people as simple as herself. You will say, wherefore this long story? It is to let you see the care I have taken, to crown all, and as you are a trusty friend, I ask you to sup with her tonight. 
i wish you would examine her a little and see if i am to be condemned for my choice with all my heart you can judge of her looks and her innocence when you converse with her as to that what you have told me cannot what i have told you falls even short of the truth i admire her simplicity on all occasions sometimes she says things at which i split my sides with laughing the other day would you believe it she was uneasy and came to ask me with unexampled innocence if children came through the ears i greatly rejoice mr arnolf what will you always call me by that name ah it comes to my lips in spite of me i never remember monsieur de la souche who on earth has put it into your head to change your name at forty-two years of age and give yourself a title from a rotten old tree on your farm besides that the house is known by that name la souche pleases my ear better than arnolf what a pity to give up the genuine name of one's fathers and take one based on chimaras most people have it itching that way and without including you in the comparison i knew a country fellow called grospierre who having no property but a rood of land had a muddy ditch made all around it and took the high-sounding name of monsieur de isle you might dispense with such examples but at all events de la souche is the name i bear i have a reason for it i like it and to call me otherwise is to annoy me most people find it hard to fall in with it i even yet see letters addressed i endure it easily from those who are not informed but you be it so we will make no difficulty about it i will take care to accustom my lips to call you nothing else than monsieur de la souche farewell i am going to knock here to wish them good morning and simply to say that i have come back chrysalde aside upon my word i think he is a perfect fool arnulf alone he is a little touched on certain points strange to see how each man is passionately fond of his own opinion knocks at his door hello scene two arnolf alain georgette with him who knocks open the door aside i think they will be very glad to see me after ten days absence who's there i georgette well open the door there go and do it yourself you go and do it indeed i shall not go no more shall i fine compliments while i am left without hello here please who knocks your master Alain. what it is the master open the door quickly open it yourself i am blowing the fire i'm taking care that the sparrow does not go out for fear of the cat whoever of you two does not open the door shall have no food for four days Ugh. why do you come when i was running why should you more than i a pretty trick indeed stand out of the way stand out of the way yourself i wish to open the door and so do i you shall not no more shall you nor you i need have patience here alain entering there it is i master georgette entering your servant it is i if it were not out of respect for the master here i arnulf receiving a push from alain <laughs> hang it pardon me look at the lot it was she also master hold your tongues both of you just answer me and let us have no more fooling well alain how is everyone here master we arnulf takes off alain's hat master we arnulf takes it off again thank heaven we arnulf taking off the hat a third time and flinging it on the ground 
who taught you impertinent fool to speak to me with your hat on your head you're right i'm wrong arnolf to alain ask agnes to come down scene three arnolf georgette was she sad after i went away sad no no yes yes why then may i die on the spot but she expected to see you return every minute and we never heard a horse an ass or a mule pass by without her thinking it was you scene four arnolf agnes alain georgette work in hand that is a good sign well agnes i have returned are you glad of it yes sir heaven be thanked i too am glad to see you again you have always been well i see you have except for the fleas which troubled me in the night ah you shall soon have someone to drive them away i shall be pleased with that i can easily imagine it what are you doing there i am making myself some caps your nightshirts and caps are finished oh, that is all right well go upstairs do not tire yourself I will soon return and talk to you of important matters. Scene 5. Arnulf, alone. Heroines of the day, learned ladies who spout tender and fine sentiments, I defy in a breath all your verses, your novels, your letters, your love letters, your entire science, to be worth as much as this virtuous and modest ignorance. We must not be dazzled by riches, and so long as honour is scene six horace arnolf what do i see is it yes i am mistaken but no no it is himself hor monsieur anne horace arnolf oh what joy indeed and how long have you been here nine days really i went straight to your house but in vain i was in the country yes you had been gone ten days oh how these children spring up in a few years i am amazed to see him so tall after having known him no higher than that you see how it is but tell me how is orange your father my good and dear friend whom i esteem and revere what is he doing what is he saying is he still hearty he knows i am interested in all that affects him we have not seen one another these four years nor what is more written to each other i think monsieur arnulf he is still more cheerful than ourselves i had a letter from him for you but he has since informed me in another letter that he is coming here though as yet i do not know the reason for it can you tell me which of your townsmen has returned with abundance of wealth earned during a fourteen years residence in america no have you not heard his name Enric? No my father speaks of him and his return as though he should be well known to me he writes that they are about to set out together on an affair of consequence of which his letter says nothing gives orant's letter to arnulf i shall assuredly be very glad to see him and shall do my best to entertain him after reading the letter friends do not need to send such polite letters and all these compliments are unnecessary even if he had not taken the trouble to write one word you might have freely disposed of all i have i am a man who takes people at their word and i have present need of a hundred pistols upon my word you oblige me by using me thus i rejoice that i have them with me keep the purse too i must drop this ceremony well how do you like this town so far its inhabitants are numerous its buildings splendid and i should think that its amusements are wonderful everyone has his own pleasures after his own fashion but for those whom we christen our gallants they have in this town just what pleases them for the women are born flirts dark and fair are amiably disposed and the husbands are also the most kind in the world it is a pleasure fit for a king to me it is a mere comedy to see the pranks i do perhaps you've already smitten someone have you had no adventure yet men of your figure can do more than men who have money 
you are cut out to make a cuckold <laughs> not to deceive you as to the simple truth i have had a certain love passed in these parts and friendship compels me to tell you of it arnulf aside good here's another queer story to set down in my pocket-book but pray let these things be secret oh you know that in these matters a secret divulge destroys our expectations i will then frankly confess to you that my heart has been smitten in this place by a certain fair maid my little attentions were at once so successful that i obtained a pleasant introduction to her not to boast too much nor to do her an injustice affairs go very well with me ha <laughs> ha and she is horace pointing to the house of agnes a young creature living in yonder house of which you can see the red walls from this simple of a truth through the matchless folly of a man who hides her from all the world but who amidst the ignorance in which she would enslave her discloses charms that throw one into raptures as well as a thoroughly engaging manner and something indescribably tender against which no heart is proof but perhaps you have seen this young star of love adorned by so many charms agnes is her name arnulf aside oh i shall burst with rage as for the man i think his name is oh, uh, de la zeus or souche i did not much concern myself about the name he is rich by what they told me but not one of the wisest of men they say he is a ridiculous fellow do you not know him arnulf aside it is a bitter pill i have to swallow why you do not speak a word oh yes i know him he is a fool is he not Oof. what do you say ah uh, that means yes jealous i suppose ridiculously so stupid i see he is just as they told me to be brief the lovely agnes has succeeded in enslaving me she is a pretty jewel to tell you honestly it would be a sin if such a rare beauty were left in the power of this eccentric fellow for me all my efforts all my dearest wishes are to make her mine in spite of this jealous wretch and the money which i so freely borrow of you was only to bring this laudable enterprise to a conclusion you know better than i that whatever we undertake money is the master key to all great plans and that this sweet metal which distracts so many promotes our triumphs in love as in war you seem vexed can it be that you disapprove of my design no but i was thinking this conversation wearies you farewell i will soon pay you a visit to return thanks arnulf thinking himself alone what must it Horace returning once again pray be discreet do not go and spread my secret abroad arnulf thinking himself alone i feel within my soul horace returning again and above all to my father who would perhaps get enraged if he knew of it arnulf expecting horace to return again oh scene seven arnulf alone oh what i have endured during this conversation never was trouble of mind equal to mine with what rashness and extreme haste did he come to tell me of this affair though my second name keeps him at fault did ever any blunderer run on so furiously but having endured so much i ought to have refrained until i had learned that which i have reason to fear to have drawn out his foolish chattering to the end and ascertained their secret understanding completely let me try to overtake him i fancy he is not far off let me worm from him the whole mystery i tremble for the misfortune which may befall me for we often seek more than we wish to find end of act one Act Two of The School for Wives by Moliere. Translated by Henry van Laun. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One, Arnulf alone. It is no doubt well when I think of it that I have lost my way and failed to find him. For after all, I should not have been able entirely to conceal from his eyes the overwhelming pang of my heart. The grief that preys upon me would have broken forth, and I do not wish him to know what he is at present ignorant of. But I am not the man to put up with this, and leave a free field for this young spark to pursue his design. I am resolved to check his progress and learn without delay how far they understand each other my honour is specially involved in this i regard her already as my wife she cannot have made a slip without covering me with shame and whatever she does will be placed to my account fatal absence unfortunate voyage knocks at his door scene two arnolf alain georgette ah oh, master this time peace come here both of you that way that way come along come i tell you ah you frighten me all my blood runs cold is it thus you have obeyed me in my absence you have both combined to betray me georgette falling at arnolf's feet oh master do not eat me i implore you alain aside i'm sure some mad dog has bitten him arnulf aside oh i cannot speak i am so filled with rage i am choking and should like to throw off my clothes to alain and georgette you cursed scoundrels you have permitted a man to come to alain who tries to escape you would run away would you you must this instant to georgette if you move now i wish you to tell me to alain hey yes i wish you both alain and georgette rise and try again to escape whoever of you moves upon my word i shall knock him down how came that man into my house now speak make haste quick directly instantly no thinking will you speak oh oh, oh, oh. georgette falling at his knees my heart fails me alain falling at his knees i'm dying arnulf aside i perspire all over let me take a breath i must fan myself and walk about could i believe when i saw horace as a little boy that he would grow up for this heaven how i suffer i think it would be better that i should gently draw from agnes's own mouth on account of what touches me so let me try to moderate my anger patience my heart softly softly to alain and georgette rise go in and bid agnes come to me stay a surprise would be less they will go and tell her how uneasy i am i will go myself and bring her out wait for me here scene three alain georgette heavens how terrible he is his looks made me afraid horribly afraid never did i see a more hideous christian this gentleman has vexed him i told you so but what on earth is the reason that he so strictly makes us keep our mistress in the house why does he wish to hide her from all the world and cannot bear to see any one approach her because that makes him jealous but how has he got such a fancy into his head because because he's jealous yes but wherefore is he so and why this anger because jealousy uh, understand me georgette jealousy is a thing a, a thing which makes people uneasy and which drives folk all round the house i'm going to give you an example so that you may understand the thing better 
tell me is it not true that when you have your broth in your hand and some hungry person comes up to eat it you would be in a rage and be ready to beat him yes i understand that it's just the same woman is in fact the broth of man and when a man sees other folks sometimes trying to dip their fingers in his broth he soon displays extreme anger at it yes but why does not every one do the same why do we see some who seem to be pleased when their wives are with some handsome fine gentleman because every one has not the greedy love which will give nothing away if i am not blind i see him returning your eyes are good it is he oh, see how vexed he is that's because he's in trouble scene four arnolf alain georgette arnolf aside a certain greek told the emperor augustus as an axiom as useful as it was true when any accident puts us in a rage we should first of all repeat the alphabet so that in the interval our anger may abate and we may do nothing that we ought not to do i have followed his advice in the matter of agnes and i have brought her here designedly under pretence of taking a walk so that the suspicions of my disordered mind may cunningly lead her to the topic and by sounding her heart gently find out the truth Scene five. Arnolf, Agnes, Alain, Georgette. Come, Agnes. To Alain and Georgette. Get you in. Scene six. Arnolf, Agnes. This is a nice walk. Very nice. What a fine day. Very fine. What news? The kitten is dead. Pity. But what then? We are all mortal, and every one is for himself. Uh, did it rain when I was in the country? No. Were you not wearied? I am never wearied. What did you do, then, these nine or ten days? Six shirts, I think, and six nightcaps also. Arnolf, after musing. The world, dear Agnes, is a strange place observe the scandal and how everybody gossips some of the neighbours have told me that an unknown young man came to the house in my absence that you permitted him to see and talk to you but i did not believe these slandering tongues and i offered to bet that it was false oh heaven do not bet you would assuredly lose what it is true that a man quite true i declare to you that he was scarcely ever out of the house arnolf aside this confession so candidly made at least assures me of her simplicity aloud but i think agnes if my memory is clear that i forbade you to see any one yes but you do not know why i saw him you would doubtless have done as much possibly but tell me then how it was it is very wonderful and hard to believe i was on the balcony working in the open air when i saw a handsome young man passing close to me under the trees who seeing me look at him immediately bowed very respectfully i not to be rude made him a curtsy suddenly he made another bow i quickly made another curtsy and when he repeated it for the third time i answered it directly with a third curtsy he went on returned went past again and each time made me another bow and I, who was looking earnestly at all these acts of politeness, returned him as many curtsies. So that if night had not fallen just then, I should have kept on continually in that way, not wishing to yield, and had the vexation of his thinking me less civil than himself. Very good. Next day, being at the door, an old woman accosted me, and said to me something like this, My child, may good heaven bless you, and keep you long in all your beauty. It does not make you such a lovely creature to abuse its gifts. You must know that you have wounded a heart which today is driven to complain. Arnolf aside. Oh, tool of Satan, 
damnable wretch have i wounded any one i answered quite astonished yes she said wounded you have indeed wounded a gentleman it is him you saw yesterday from the balcony alas said i what could have been the cause did i without thinking let anything fall on him no replied she it was your eyes which gave the fatal blow from their glances came all his injury alas good heaven said i i am more than ever surprised do my eyes contain something bad that they can give it to other people yes cried she your eyes my girl have poisoned hurt with all of which you know nothing in a word the poor fellow pines away and if continued the charitable old woman your cruelty refuses him assistance it is likely he shall be carried to his grave in a couple of days bless me said i i would be very sorry for that but what assistance does he require of me my child said she he requests only the happiness of seeing and conversing with you your eyes alone can prevent his ruin and cure the disease they have caused oh gladly said i and since it is so he may come to see me here as often as he likes arnulf aside oh cursed witch poisoner of souls may hell reward your charitable tricks that is how he came to see me and got cured now tell me frankly if i was not right and could i after all have the conscience to let him die for lack of aid i who feel so much pity for suffering people and cannot see a chicken die without weeping arnulf aside all this comes only from an innocent soul i blame my imprudent absence for it which left this kindliness of heart without a protector exposed to the wiles of artful seducers i fear that the rascal in his bold passion has carried the matter somewhat beyond a joke what ails you i think you are a little angry was there anything wrong in what i have told you no but tell me what followed and how the young man behaved during his visits alas if you but knew how delighted he was how he got rid of his illness as soon as i saw him the present he made me of a lovely casket and the money which elaine and georgette have had from him you would no doubt love him and say as we say yes but what did he do when he was alone with you he swore that he loved me with an unequalled passion and said the prettiest words possible things that nothing ever can equal the sweetness of which charms me whenever i hear him speak and moves i know not what within me arnulf aside oh sad inquiry into a fatal mystery in which the inquirer alone suffers all the pain aloud besides all these speeches all these pretty compliments did he not also bestow a few caresses on you oh so many he took my hands and my arms and was never tired of kissing them agnes did he take nothing else from you seeing her confused <laughs> why he what took <laughs> the well i dare not tell you you will perhaps be angry with me no yes but you will good heavens no swear on your word on my word then he took my you will be in a passion no yes no 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 what the devil is this mystery what did he take from you he arnulf aside i am suffering the torments of the damned he took away from me the ribbon you gave me to tell you the truth i could not prevent him arnulf drawing his breath <sighs> oh let the ribbon go but i want to know if he did nothing to you but kiss your arms why do people do other things not at all but to cure the disorder which he said had seized him did he not ask you for any other remedy no you may judge that i would have granted him anything to do him good if he had asked for it arnulf aside by the kindness of heaven i am cheaply out of it may i be blessed if i fall into such a mistake again 
aloud Pooh, that is the result of your innocence agnes i shall say no more about it what is done is done i know that by flattering you the gallant only wishes to deceive you and to laugh at you afterwards oh no he told me so more than a score of times ah you do not know that he is not to be believed but now learn that to accept caskets and to listen to the nonsense of these handsome fops to allow them languidly to kiss your hands and charm your heart is a mortal sin and one of the greatest that can be committed a sin do you say and why pray why the reason is the absolute law that heaven is incensed by such doings incensed but why should it be incensed oh it is so sweet and agreeable how strange is the joy one feels from all this up to this time i was ignorant of these things yes all these tender passages these pretty speeches and sweet caresses are a great pleasure but they must be enjoyed in an honest manner and their sin should be taken away by marriage is it no longer a sin when one is married no then please marry me quickly if you wish it i wish it also i have returned hither for the purpose of marrying you is it possible yes how happy you will make me yes i have no doubt that marriage will please you then we too shall nothing is more certain how i shall caress you if this comes to pass ha and i shall do the same to you i can never tell when people are jesting do you speak seriously yes you might see that i do we are to be married yes but when this very evening agnes laughing <laughs> this is very evening this very evening does that make you laugh yes to see you happy is my desire oh how greatly i am obliged to you and what satisfaction i shall have with him with whom with him there him there i am not speaking of him there you are a little quick in selecting a husband in a word it is someone else whom i have ready for you and as for that gentleman i require by your leave though the illness of which he accuses you should be the death of him that henceforth you break off all intercourse with him that when he comes to the house you will by way of compliment just shut the door in his face throw a stone out of the window at him when he knocks and oblige him in good earnest never to appear again you hear me agnes i shall observe your behaviour concealed in a recess oh dear he is so handsome he is ha how you are talking i shall not have the heart no more chatter go upstairs but surely will you enough i am master i command do you go and obey end of act two Act Three of The School for Wives by Moliere, translated by Henry van Laun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One, Arnolf, Agnes, Alain, Georgette. Yes, all has gone well. My joy is extreme. You have obeyed my orders to perfection and brought the fair seducer to utter confusion. See what it is to have a wise counsellor. Your innocence, Agnes, has been betrayed. Look what you have been brought to before you had been aware of it. You are treading, deprived of my warnings, right down the broad path to hell and perdition. The way of all these young fops is but too well known. They have their fine rolls, plenty of ribbons and plumes, big wigs, good teeth, a smooth address but i tell you they have the cloven foot beneath and they are very devils whose corrupt appetites try to prey upon the honour of women this time however thanks to the care that has been taken you have escaped with your virtue the style in which i saw you throw that stone at him which has dashed the hopes of all his plans still more determines me not to delay the marriage for which i told you to prepare but before all 
it is well i should speak a few words with you which may be salutary to georgette and alain bring out a chair in the open air as for you if you ever we shall take care to remember all your instructions that other gentlemen imposed on us but if he ever gets in here may i never drink another drop besides he's a fool he gave us two gold crowns the other day which were underweight well get what i ordered for supper and as to the contract i spoke of let one of you fetch the notary who lives at the corner of the market-place scene two arnolf agnes arnolf seated agnes put your work down and listen to me raise your head a little and turn your face round putting his finger on his forehead there look at me here while i speak and take good note of even the smallest word i am going to wed you agnes you ought to bless your stars a hundred times a day to think of your former low estate and at the same time to wonder at my goodness in raising you from a poor country girl to the honourable rank of a citizen's wife to enjoy the bed and the embraces of a man who has shunned all such trammels and whose heart has refused to a score of women well fitted to please the honour which he intends to confer on you you must always keep in mind i say how insignificant you would be without this glorious alliance in order that the picture may teach you the better to merit the condition in which i shall place you and make you always know yourself so that i may never repent of what i am doing marriage agnes is no joke the position of a wife calls for strict duties i do not mean to exalt you to that condition in order that you may be free and take your ease your sex is formed for dependence omnipotence goes with the beard though there are two halves in the connection yet these two halves are by no means equal the one half is supreme the other subordinate the one is all submission to the other which rules the obedience which the well-disciplined soldier shows to his leader the servant to his master a child to his parent the lowest monk to his superior is far below the docility obedience humility and profound respect due from the wife to her husband her chief her lord and her master when he looks at her gravely her duty is at once to lower her eyes never daring to look him in the face until he chooses to favour her with a tender glance our women nowadays do not understand this but do not be spoilt by the example of others take care not to imitate those miserable flirts whose pranks are talked of all over the city and do not let the evil one tempt you that is do not listen to any young coxcomb remember agnes that in making you part of myself i give my honour into your hands which honour is fragile and easily damaged that it will not do to trifle in such a matter and that there are boiling cauldrons in hell into which wives who live wickedly are thrown for evermore i'm not telling you a parcel of stories you ought to let these lessons sink into your heart if you practise them sincerely and take care not to flirt your soul will ever be white and spotless as a lily but if you stain your honour it will become as black as coal you will seem hideous to all and one day you will become the devil's own property and boil in hell to all eternity from which may the goodness of heaven defend you make a curtsy as a novice in a convent ought to know her duties by heart so it ought to be on getting married here in my pocket i have an important document which will teach you the duty of a wife i do not know the author but it is some good soul or other and i desire that this shall be your only study rises stay let me see if you can read it fairly agnes reads the maxims of marriage or the duties of a wife together with her daily exercise first maxim she who is honourably wed should remember notwithstanding the fashion nowadays that the man who marries does not take a wife for any one but himself i shall explain what that means but at present let us only read second maxim she ought not to protect herself more than a husband likes the care of her beauty concerns him alone and if others think her plain 
That must go for nothing. Third maxim. Far from her be the study of ogling, washes, paints, pomatums, and a thousand preparations for a good complexion. These are ever fatal poisons to honour, and the pains bestowed to look beautiful are seldom taken for a husband. Fourth maxim. When she goes out, she should conceal the glances of her eyes beneath her hood, as honour requires. For in order to please a husband rightly, she should please none else. Fifth maxim. It is fit that she receives none but those who visit her husband. The gallants out of no business but with the wife are not agreeable to the husband. Sixth maxim. She must firmly refuse presents from men, for in these days nothing is given for nothing. Seventh maxim. Amongst her furniture, however she dislikes it, there must be neither writing desk, ink, paper, nor pens. According to all good rules, everything written in the house should be written by the husband. Eighth maxim. Those disorderly meetings, called social gatherings, ever corrupt the minds of women. It is good policy to forbid them, for there they conspire against the poor husbands. Ninth maxim. Every woman who wishes to preserve her honour should abstain from gambling as a plague, for play is very seductive and often drives a woman to put down her last stake. Tenth maxim. She must not venture in public promenades nor picnics, for wise men are of opinion that it is always the husband who pays for such treats. Eleventh maxim. You shall finish it by yourself, and by and by I shall explain these things to you properly, word for word. I bethink myself of an engagement. I have but one word to say, and I shall not stay long. Go in again and take special care of this volume. If the notary comes, let him wait for me a short time. Scene 3. Arnolf, alone. I cannot do better than make her my wife. I shall be able to mould her as I please. She is like a bit of wax in my hands, and I can give her what shape I like. She was near being wild away from me in my absence through her excess of simplicity. But to say the truth, it is better that a wife should err on that side. The cure for these faults is easy. Every simple person is docile. And if she is led out of the right way, a couple of words will instantly bring her back again. But a clever woman is quite another sort of animal. Our lot depends only on her judgment. Nought can divert her from what she is set on, and our teaching in such a case is futile. Her wit avails her to ridicule our maxims, often to turn her vices into virtues, and to find means to cheat the ablest, so as to compass her own ends. We labour in vain to parry the blow. A clever woman is a devil at intrigue, and when her whim has mutely passed sentence on our honour, we must knock under. Many good fellows could tell as much. But my blundering friend shall have no cause to laugh. He has reaped the harvest of his gossip. This is the general fault of Frenchmen. When they have a love adventure, secrecy bores them, and silly vanity has so many charms for them that they would rather hang themselves than hold their tongues. Oh, women are an easy prey to Satan when they go and choose such adult pates. And when... But here he is. I must dissemble and find out how he has been mortified. Scene 4. Horace Arnolf. I am come from your house. Fate seems resolved that I shall never meet you there. But I shall go so often that some time or other. Ah, for goodness sake, do not let us begin these idle compliments. Nothing vexes me like ceremony. And if I could have my way, it should be abolished. It is a wretched custom, and most people foolishly waste two-thirds of their time on it. Let us put on our hat without more ado. Puts on his hat. Well, how about your love affair? May I know, Mr. Horace, how it goes? I was diverted for a while by some business that came into my head, but since then I have been thinking of it. I admire the rapidity of your commencement, and am interested in the issue. Indeed, since I confided in you, my love has been unfortunate. Aye, how so? Cruel fate has brought her governor back from the country. What bad luck! Moreover, to my great sorrow, she has discovered what has passed in private between us. How the deuce could he discover this affair so soon? I do not know, but it certainly is so. I meant, at the usual hour, 
to pay a short visit to my young charmer when with altered voice and looks her two servants barred my entrance and somewhat rudely shut the door in my face saying be gone you bring us into trouble the door in your face in my face that was rather hard i wished to speak to them through the door but to all i said their only answer was you shan't come in master has forbidden it did they not open the door then no and agnes from the window made me more certain as to her master's return by bidding me be gone in a very angry tone and flinging a stone at me into the bargain what a stone not a small one either that was how she rewarded my visit with her own hands the devil these are no trifles your affair seems to me in a bad way true i am in a quandary through this unlucky return really i am sorry for you i declare i am this fellow mars all yes but that is nothing you will find a way to recover yourself i must try by some device to baffle the strict watch of this jealous fellow that will be easy after all the girl loves you doubtless you will compass your end i hope so the stone has put you out but you cannot wonder at it true and i understood in a moment that my rival was there and that he was directing all without being seen but what surprised me and will surprise you is another incident i am going to tell you of a bold stroke of this lovely girl which one could not have expected from her simplicity love it must be allowed is an able master he teaches us to be what we never were before a complete change in our manners is often the work of a moment under his tuition he breaks through the impediments in our nature and his sudden feats have the air of miracles in an instant he makes a miser liberal a coward brave a churl polite he renders the dullest soul fit for anything and gives wit to the most simple yes this last miracle is surprising in agnes for blurting out these very words begone i am resolved never to receive your visits i know all you would say and there is my answer this stone or pebble at which you are surprised fell at my feet with a letter oh i greatly admire this note chiming in with the significance of her words and the casting of the stone are you not surprised by such an action as this does not love know how to sharpen the understanding and can it be denied that his ardent flames have marvellous effects on the heart what say you of the trick and of the letter ah do you not admire her cunning contrivance is it not amusing to see what a part my jealous rival has played in all this game say ay very amusing laugh at it then <laughs> this fellow garrisoned against my passion who shuts himself up in his house and seems provided with stones as though i were preparing to enter by storm who in his ridiculous terror encourages all his household to drive me away is tricked before his very eyes by her whom he would keep in the utmost ignorance for my part i confess that although his return throws my love affair into disorder i think all this so exceedingly comical that i cannot forbear laughing at it whenever it comes to my head <laughs> oh it seems to me that you do not laugh at it half enough <laughs> i beg pardon i laugh at it as much as i can <laughs> but i must show you her letter for friendship's sake a hand knew how to set down all that her heart felt but in such touching terms so kind so innocently tender so ingenuous oh in a word just as an unaffected nature confesses its first attack of love arnolf softly this is the use you make of writing you hussy it was against my wish you ever learned it horace reads i wish to write to you but i am at a loss how to begin i have some thoughts which i should like you to know but i do not know how to tell them to you and i mistrust my own words as i begin to feel that i have been always kept in ignorance i fear to say something which is not right 
and to express more than I ought. In fact, I do not know what you have done to me, but I fear that I am desperately vexed at what I am made to do against you, that it will be the hardest thing in the world for me to do without you, and that I should be very glad to be with you. Perhaps it is wrong to say that, but the truth is I cannot help saying it, and I wish it could be brought about without harm. I am assured that all young men are deceivers, that they must not be listened to, and that all you told me was but to deceive me. But I assure you I have not yet come to believe that of you, and I am so touched by her words that I could not believe them false. Tell me frankly if they be, for to be brief, as I am without an evil thought, you would be extremely wicked to deceive me, and I think I should die of vexation at such a thing. Arnolf, aside. Ah, the cat! What is wrong? Wrong? Nothing. I was only coughing. Have you ever heard a more tender expression? In spite of the cursed endeavours of unreasonable power, could you imagine a more genuine nature? Is it not beyond doubt a terrible crime, villainously to mar such an admirable spirit, to try to stifle this bright soul in ignorance and stupidity? Love has begun to tear away the veil, and if, thanks to some lucky star, I can deal as I hope with this sheer animal, this wretch, this hangdog, this scoundrel, this brute. Uh, goodbye. Why are you in such a hurry? It just occurs to me that I have a pressing engagement. But do you not know anyone? For you live close by who could get access to this house. I am open with you, and it is the usual thing for friends to help each other in these cases. I have no one there now except people who watch me maid and man as i just experienced would not cease their rudeness and listen to me do what i would i had for some time in my interest an old woman of remarkable shrewdness in fact more than human she served me well in the beginning but the poor woman died four days ago can you not devise some plan for me no really you will easily find someone without me <sighs> good-bye then you see what confidence i put in you Scene five. Arnolf, alone. How I am obliged to suffer before him. How hard it is to conceal my gnawing pain. What? Such ready wit in a simpleton. The traitress has pretended to be so to my face, or the devil has breathed this cunning into her heart. But now that cursed letter is the death of me. I see that the rascal has corrupted her mind and has established himself there in my stead. This is despair and deadly anguish for me. I suffer doubly by being robbed of her heart, for love as well as honour is injured by it. It drives me mad to find my place usurped, and I am enraged to see my prudence defeated. I know that to punish her guilty passion I have only to leave her to her evil fate, and that I shall be revenged on her by herself but it is very vexatious to lose what we love. Good heaven! After employing so much philosophy in my choice, why am I to be so terribly bewitched by her charms? She has neither relatives, friends, nor money. She abuses my care, my kindness, my tenderness, and yet I love her to distraction, even after this base trick. Fool, have you no shame? Oh, I cannot contain myself. I am mad. I could punch my head a thousand times over. I shall go in for a little, but only to see what she looks like after so vile a deed. Oh, heaven, grant that my brow may escape dishonour. Or rather, if it is decreed that I must endure it, at least grant me, under such misfortunes, that fortitude with which few are endowed. End of Act 3 Act 4 of The School for Wives by Moliere Translated by Henry van Laun This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Act 4 Scene 1. Arnulf, alone. I declare I cannot rest anywhere. 
my mind is troubled by a thousand cares thinking how to contrive both indoors and out so as to frustrate the attempts of this coxcomb with what assurance the traitress stood the sight of me she is not a whit moved by all that she has done and though she has brought me within an inch of the grave one could swear to look at her that she had no hand in it the more composed she looked when i saw her the more i was enraged and those ardent transports which inflamed my heart seemed to redouble my great love for her i was provoked angry incensed against her and yet i never saw her look so lovely her eyes never seemed to me so bright never before did they inspire me with such vehement desires i feel that it will be the death of me if my evil destiny should bring upon me this disgrace what i have brought her up with so much tenderness and forethought i have had her with me from her infancy i have indulged in the fondest hopes about her my heart trusted to her growing charms i have fondled her as my own for thirteen years as i imagined all for a young fool with whom she is in love to come and carry her off before my face and that when she is already half married to me no by heaven no by heaven my foolish young friend you will be a cunning fellow to overturn my scheme for upon my word all your hopes will be in vain and you shall find no reason for laughing at me scene two a notary arnolf there he is good day here i am ready to draw up the contract which you wish arnolf not seeing or hearing him how is it to be done it must be in the usual form arnolf thinking himself alone i shall take the greatest possible care i shall do nothing contrary to your interests arnolf not seeing him i must guard against all surprise it is enough that your affairs are placed in my hands for fear of deception you must not sign the contract before receiving the portion arnolf thinking himself alone i fear if i let anything get abroad that this business will become town talk well it is easy to avoid this publicity and your contract can be drawn up privately arnolf thinking himself alone but how shall i manage it with her the jointure shall be proportionate to the fortune she brings you arnolf not seeing him i love her and that love is my great difficulty in that case the wife may have so much the more arnolf thinking himself alone how can i act towards her in such a case the regular way is that the husband that is to be settles on the wife that is to be a third of her marriage portion as a jointure but this rule goes for nothing and you may do a great deal more if you have a mind to it if oh seeing him as for the precipit that is a question for both sides i say the husband can settle on his wife what he thinks proper eh he can benefit her when he loves her much and wishes to do her a favor and that by way of jointure or settlement as it is called which is lost upon her death either without revision going from her to her heirs or by statute as people have a mind or by actual deed of gift in form which may be made either single or mutual why do you shrug your shoulders am i talking like a fool or do i not understand contracts who can teach me no one i imagine do i not know that when people are married they have a joint right to all movables monies fixtures and acquisitions unless they resign it by act of renunciation do i not know that a third part of the portion of the wife that is to be becomes common in order yes verily you know all this but who has said one word to you about it you who seems to take me for a fool shrugging your shoulders and making faces at me hang the man and his beastly face good day that's the way to get rid of you was i not brought here to draw up a contract yes i sent for you but the business is put off 
i shall send for you again when the time is fixed what a devil of a fellow he is with his jabbering notary alone i think he is mad and i believe i am right scene three a notary alain georgette did you not come to fetch me to your master yes i do not know what you think but go and tell him from me that he is a downright fool we will not fail scene four arnolf alain georgette sir come here you are my faithful my good my real friends i have news for you the notary never mind some other day for that a foul plot is contrived against my honour what a disgrace it would be for you my children if your master's honour were taken away after that you would not dare to be seen anywhere for whoever saw you would point at you so since the affair concerns you as well as me you must take care that this spark may not in any way you have taught us our lesson just now but take care not to listen to his fine speeches oh certainly we know how to deny him suppose he should come now wheedling alain my good fellow cheer my drooping spirits by a little help you are a fool you are right to georgette georgette my darling you look so sweet-tempered and so kind you are a lout you are right to alain what harm do you find in an honest and perfectly virtuous scheme you are a rogue capital to georgette i shall surely die if you do not take pity on my sufferings you are a brazen-faced blockhead first rate to alain i am not one who expects something for nothing i can remember those who serve me here alain is a trifle in advance to have a drink with and georgette here is wherewith to buy you a petticoat both hold out their hands and take the money this is only an earnest of what i intend to do for you i ask no other favour but that you will let me see your pretty mistress georgette pushing him try your games elsewhere that was good alain pushing him get out of this very good georgette pushing him immediately good hello that is enough am i not doing right is this how you would have us act yes capital except for the money which you must not take we did not think of that shall we begin again now no it is enough go in both of you you need only say so no i tell you go in when i desire you you may keep the money go i shall soon be with you again keep your eyes open and second my efforts scene five arnolf alone i will get the cobbler who lives at the corner of the street to be my spy and tell me everything i mean to keep her always indoors watch her constantly and banish in particular all sellers of ribbons tire women hairdressers kerchief makers glove sellers dealers in left off apparel and all those folks who make it their business clandestinely to bring people together who are in love in fact i have seen the world and understand its tricks my spark must be very cunning if a love letter or message gets in here scene six horace arnolf how lucky i am to meet you here oh i had a narrow escape just now i can assure you as i left you i unexpectedly saw agnes alone on her balcony breathing the fresh air from the neighbouring trees after giving me a sign she contrived to come down into the garden and open the door but we were scarcely into her room before she heard a jealous gentleman upon the stairs and all she could do in such a case was to lock me into a large wardrobe he entered the room at once i did not see him but i heard him walking up and down at a great rate without saying a word 
but sighing desperately at intervals and occasionally thumping the table striking a little frisky dog and madly throwing about whatever came in his way in his rage he broke the very vases with which the beauty had adorned her mantelpiece doubtless the tricks she played must have come to the ears of this cuckold in embryo at last having in a score of ways vented his passion on things that could not help themselves my restless jealous gentleman left the room without saying what disturbed him and i left my wardrobe we would not stay long together for fear of my rival it would have been too great a risk but late to-night i am to enter her room without making a noise i am to announce myself by three hymns and then the window is to be opened whereby with a ladder and the help of agnes my love will try to gain me admittance i tell you this as my only friend joy is increased by imparting it and should we taste perfect bliss a hundred times over it would not satisfy us unless it were known to some one i believe you will sympathize in my success well, good-bye i am going to make the needful preparations scene seven arnolf alone what will the star which is bent on driving me to despair allow me no time to breathe am i to see through their mutual understanding my watchful care and my wisdom defeated one after another must i in my mature age become the dupe of a simple girl and a scatterbrained young fellow for twenty years like a discreet philosopher i have been musing on the wretched fate of married men and have carefully informed myself of the accidents which plunge the most prudent into misfortune profiting in my own mind by the disgrace of others and having a wish to marry i sought out to secure my forehead from attack and prevent its being matched with those of other men for this noble end i thought i had put in practice all that human policy could invent but as though it were decreed by fate that no man here below should be exempt from it after all my experience and the knowledge i have been able to glean of such matters after more than twenty years of meditation so as to guide myself with all precaution i have avoided the tracks of so many husbands to find myself after all involved in the same disgrace oh, cursed fate you shall yet be a liar i am still possessor of the loved one if her heart be stolen by this obnoxious fop i shall at least take care that he does not seize anything else this night which they have chosen for their pretty plan shall not be spent so agreeably as they anticipate it is some pleasure to me amidst all this to know that he has warned me of the snare he is laying and that this blunderer who would be my ruin makes a confidant of his own rival scene eight chrysalde arnolf well shall we take our supper before our walk no i fast to-night whence this fancy pray excuse me there is something that hinders me is not your intended marriage to take place you take too much trouble about other people's affairs oh ho so snappish what ails you have you encountered any little mishap in your love my friend by your face i could almost swear you have whatever happens i shall at least have the advantage of being unlike some folks who meekly suffer the visits of gallants it is an odd thing that with so much intelligence you always get so frightened at these matters that you set your whole happiness on this and imagine no other kind of honour in the world to be a miser a brute a rogue wicked and cowardly is nothing in your mind compared with this stain and however a man may have lived he is a man of honour if he is not a cuckold after all why do you imagine that our glory depends on such an accident and that a virtuous mind must reproach itself for the evil which it cannot prevent tell me why do you hold that a man in taking a wife deserves praise or blame for the choice he makes and why do you form a frightful bugbear out of the offences caused by her want of fidelity be persuaded that a man of honour may have a less serious notion of cuckoldom that as none is secure from strokes of chance this accident ought to be a matter of indifference and that all the evil whatever the world may say is in the mode of receiving it to behave well under these difficulties as in all else a man must shun extremes not ape those over simple folk who are proud of such affairs and are ever inviting the gallants of their wives 
praising them everywhere, and crying them up, displaying their sympathy with them, coming to all their entertainments and all their meetings, and making everyone wonder at their having the assurance to show their faces there. This way of acting is no doubt highly culpable, but the other extreme is no less to be condemned. If I do not approve of such as are the friends of their wives' gallants, no more do I approve of your violent man, whose indiscreet resentment, full of rage and fury, draws the eyes of all the world on them by its noise, and who seem, from their outbreaks, unwilling that any one should be ignorant of what is wrong with them. There is a mean between these extremes, where a wise man stops in such a case. When we know how to take it, there is no reason to blush for the worst a woman can do to us. In short, say what you will, cockolding may easily be made to seem less terrible. And, as I told you before, all your dexterity lies in being able to turn the best side outwards. After this fine harangue, all the brotherhood owes your worship thanks, and any one who hears you speak will be delighted to enrol himself. I do not say that, for that is what I have found fault with. But as fortune gives us a wife, I say that we should act as we do when we gamble with dice, when, if you do not get what you want, you must be shrewd and good-tempered, to amend your luck by good management. That is, sleep and eat well, and persuade yourself that it is all nothing. You think to make a joke of it. But to be candid, I know a hundred things in the world more to be dreaded, and which I should think a much greater misfortune than the accident you are so grievously afraid of. Do you think that, in choosing between the two alternatives, I should not prefer to be what you say, rather than see myself married to one of those good creatures whose ill humor makes a quarrel out of nothing? Those dragons of virtue, those respectable she-devils, ever piquing themselves on their wise conduct, who, because they do not do us a trifling wrong, take on themselves to behave haughtily? and because they are faithful to us, expect that we should bear everything from them? Once more, my friend, know that cuckoldom is just what we make of it, that on some accounts it is even to be desired, and that it has its pleasures like other things. If you are of a mind to be satisfied with it, I am not disposed to try it myself, and rather than submit to such a thing. Bless me! Do not swear, lest you should be forsworn. If fate has willed it, your precautions are useless, and your advice will not be taken in the matter. I? I, a cuckold? You are in a bad way. A thousand folks or so, I mean no offense, who, for bearing, courage, fortune, and family, would scorn comparison with you. And I, on my side, will not draw comparisons with them. But let me tell you, this pleasantry annoys me. Let us have done with it, if you please. You are in a passion. We shall know the cause. Good-bye, but remember, whatever your honour prompts you to do in this business, to swear you will never be what we have talked of is halfway towards being it. And I swear it again. I am going this instant to find a good remedy against such an accident. Scene 9. Arnolf, Alain, Georgette. My friends, now is the time that I beg your assistance. I am touched by your affection. But it must be well proved on this occasion, and if you serve me in this, as I'm sure you will, you may count on your reward. The man you wot of, but not a word, seeks, as I understand, to trick me this very night, and enter by a ladder into Agnès's room. But we three must lay a trap for him. I would have each of you take a good cudgel, and when he shall be nearly on the top round of the ladder, for I shall open the window at the proper time, both of you shall fall on the rascal for me, so that his back may be sure to remember it, in order that he may learn never to come here again. Yet do it without naming me in any way, or making it appear that I am behind. Would you have the courage to execute my resentment? If the thrashing is all, sir, rely on us. You shall see where I beat, if I am a slow coach. Though my arm may not look so strong, it shall play its part in the drubbing. Get you in, then, and above all, mind you do not chatter. Alone? This is a useful lesson for my neighbours. If all the husbands in town were to receive their wives' gallants in this fashion, the number of cuckolds would not be so great. 
End of Act 4. Act 5 of The School for Wives by Moliere. Translated by Henry van Laun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 5. Scene 1. Arnolf, Alain, Georgette. Wretches! What have you done by your violence? We have obeyed you, sir. It is of no use trying to defend yourselves by such an excuse. My orders were to beat him, not to murder him. I told you to discharge your blows on his back, not on his head. Good heavens! Into what a plight my fate has now thrown me! And what course can I take, as the man is dead? Go into the house, and be sure to say nothing of the harmless order that I gave you. Alone. It will be daylight presently, and I shall go and consider how to bear myself under this misfortune. Alas, what will become of me? And what will Horace's father say when he shall suddenly hear of this affair? Scene 2. Arnolf, Horace. Horace, aside. I must go and make out who it is. Arnolf, thinking himself alone. Could one ever have foreseen? Running against Horace. Oh, who is there, pray? Is it you, Monsieur Arnolf? Yes, but who are you? Horace, I was going to your house to beg a favour. You are out very early. Arnolf, to himself aside. Wonderful! Is it magic? Is it a vision? To tell the truth, I was in a great difficulty. I thank heaven's great goodness that at the nick of time I thus meet you. Let me tell you that everything has succeeded, much better even than I could have predicted, and by an accident which might have spoiled all. I do not know how our appointment could possibly have been suspected, but just as I was reaching the window, I unluckily saw some persons who, unceremoniously raising their hand against me, made me miss my footing and fall to the ground, which, at the expense of a bruise, saved me from a score of blows. These people, of whom I fancy my jealous rival was one, attributed my fall to their blows, and as the pain compelled me to lie for some time motionless, they honestly thought they had killed me, and were greatly alarmed. I heard all their noise in profound silence, each accusing the other of the violence, and complaining of their ill fortune, came softly, without a light, to feel if I were dead. You may imagine that I contrived, in the darkness of night, to assume the appearance of a real corpse. They went away in great terror, and as I was thinking how I should make my escape, the young Agnes, frightened by my pretended death, came to me in great concern, for the talking of these people had reached her ears from the very first, and, being unobserved during all this commotion, she easily escaped from the house. But finding me unhurt, she displayed a transport which it would be difficult to describe. What more need I say? The lovely girl obeyed the promptings of her affection, were not returned to her room, and committed her fate to my honour. You may judge from this instance of innocence to what she is exposed by the mad intolerance of a fool, and what frightful risks she might have run if I were a man to hold her less dear than I do. But too pure a passion fills my soul. I would rather die than wrong her. I see in her charms worthy of a better fate, and not but death shall part us. I foresee the rage my father will be in, but we must find an opportunity to appease his anger. I cannot help being transported by charms so delightful, and in short we must in this life be satisfied with our lot. What I wish you to do, as a confidential friend, is to let me place this beauty under your care, and that, in the interest of my love, you will conceal her in your house for at least a day or two, for, besides that I must conceal her flight from every one, to prevent any successful pursuit of her, you know that a young girl, especially such a beautiful one, would be strongly suspected in the company of a young man, 
and as i have trusted the whole secret of my passion to you being assured of your prudence so to you only as a generous friend can i confide this beloved treasure be assured i am entirely at your service you will really do me so great a favour very willingly i tell you i am delighted at the opportunity of serving you i thank heaven for putting it in my way i never did anything with so much pleasure how much i am obliged to you for all your kindness i feared a difficulty on your part but you know the world and your wisdom can excuse the art of youth one of my servants is with her at the corner of the street but how shall we manage for day begins to break if i take her here i may be seen and if you come to my house the servants will talk to take a safe course you must bring her to me in a darker place that alley of mine is convenient i shall wait for her there it is quite right to use these precautions i shall only place her in your hands and return at once to my lodgings without more ado arnulf alone ah oh, fortune this propitious accident makes amends for all the mischief which your caprice has done he muffles himself up in his cloak scene three agnes horace arnulf arnulf to agnes do not be uneasy at the place i am taking you to i conduct you to a safe abode it would ruin all for you to lodge with me go in at this door and follow where you are led arnulf takes her hand without being recognized by her agnes to horace why do you leave me dear agnes it must be so remember then i pray you to return soon my love urges me sufficiently for that i feel no joy but when i see you away from you i also am sad alas if that were so you would stay here what can you doubt my excess of love no you do not love me as much as i love you oh he is pulling me too hard arnulf pulls her away it is because it is dangerous dear agnes for us to be seen together here this true friend whose hand draws you away acts with the prudent zeal that inspires him on our behalf but to follow a stranger fear nothing in such hands you cannot but be safe i would rather be in horace's and i should to arnulf who still drags her away stay a little farewell the day drives me away when shall i see you then very soon you may be sure how weary i shall be till i do horace going thank heaven my happiness is no longer in suspense now i can sleep securely scene four arnulf agnes arnulf concealed by his cloak and disguising his voice come it is not there you are going to lodge i have provided a room for you elsewhere and i intend to place you where you will be safe enough discovering himself do you know me oh my face frightens you now hussy it is a disappointment to you to see me here i interrupt your love and its pretty contrivances agnes looks for horace do not imagine you can call your lover to your aid with those eyes of yours he is too far off to give you any assistance so so young as you are you can play such pranks your simplicity that seemed so extraordinary asks if infants came through the ear yet you manage to make an assignation by night and to slink out silently in order to follow your gallant Gad, how coaxing your tongue was with him you must have been at a good school who the deuce has taught you so much all on a sudden you are no longer afraid then to meet ghosts this gallant has given you courage in the night-time ah oh, baggage to arrive at such a pitch of deceit to form such a plot in spite of all my kindness little serpent that i have warmed in my bosom and that as soon as it feels it is alive 
tries ungratefully to injure him that cherished it. Why do you scold me? Of a truth, I do wrong. I am not conscious of harm in all that I have done. To run after a gallant is not, then, an infamous thing? He is one who says he wishes to marry me. I followed your directions. You taught me we ought to marry in order to avoid sin. Yes, but I meant to take you to wife myself. I think I gave you to understand it clearly enough. You did, but to be frank with you, he is more to my taste for a husband than you. With you, marriage is a trouble and a pain, and your description gives a terrible picture of it. But there, he makes it seem so full of joy that I long to marry. Oh, traitress, that is because you love him. Yes, I love him. And you have the impudence to tell me so. Why, if it is true, should I not say so? Ought you to love him, minx? Alas, can I help it? He alone is the cause of it. I was not thinking of it when it came about. But you ought to have driven away that amorous desire. How can we drive away what gives us pleasure? And did you not know that it would displease me? I? Not at all. What harm can it do you? True, I ought to rejoice at it. You do not love me then, after all. You? Yes. Alack, no. How? No. Would you have me tell a fib? Why not love me, Madam Impudence? Heaven, you ought not to blame me. Why did you not make yourself loved, as he has done? I did not prevent you, I fancy. I tried all I could, but all my pains were to no purpose. Of a truth, then, he knows more about it than you, for he had no difficulty in making himself loved. Arnulf, aside. See how the jade reasons and retorts. Plague! Could one of your witty ladies say more about it? Oh, I was a dolt. Or else, on my honour, a fool of a girl knows more than the wisest man. To Agnes. Since you are so good at reasoning, Madam Chop Logic, should I have maintained you so long for his benefit? No. He will pay you back, even to the last farthing. Arnulf, aside. She hits on words that double my vexation. Aloud. With all his ability, hussy, will he discharge me the obligations that you owe me? I do not owe you as much as you think. Was the care of bringing you up nothing? Verily, you've been at great pains there, and have caused me to be finely taught throughout. Do you think I flatter myself so far as not know in my own mind that I am an ignoramus? I am ashamed of myself, and at my age I do not wish to pass any longer for a fool if I can help it. You shrink from ignorance, but would learn something of your spark at any cost. To be sure. It is from him I know what I do know. I fancy. I owe him much more than you. Really? What prevents me from revenging this saucy talk with a cuff? I am enraged at the sight of her provoking coldness, and to beat her would be a satisfaction to me. Ah, oh, you can do that if you choose. Arnulf, aside... That speech and that look disarm my fury and bring back the tenderness to my heart which effaces all her guilt. How strange it is to be in love. To think that men should be subject to such weakness for these traitresses. Everyone knows their imperfection. They are extravagant and indiscreet. Their mind is wicked and their understanding weak. There is naught weaker, more imbecile, more faithless. And in spite of it all, everything in the world is done for the sake of these bipeds. To Agnes. Well, let us make peace. Listen, little wretch. I forgive all and restore you to my affection. Learn thus how much I love you. And seeing me so good, love me in return. With all my heart, I should like to please you, if it were in my power. Poor little darling, you can if you will. Just listen to this sigh of love. <sighs> See this dying look, behold my person, and forsake this young coxcomb and the love he inspires. He must have thrown some spell over you, and you will be a hundred times happier with me. Your desire is to be finely dressed and frolicsome, then I swear you shall ever be so. I will fondle you night and day, I will hug you, kiss you, devour you. You shall do everything you have a mind to. I do not enter into particulars, and that is saying everything. Aside. To what length will my passion go? 
aloud in short nothing can equal my love what proof would you have me give you ungrateful girl would you have me weep shall i beat myself shall i tear out one half of my hair shall i kill myself yes say so if you will i am quite ready cruel creature to convince you of my love stay all you say does not touch my heart horace could do more with a couple of words ah oh, this is too great an insult and provokes my anger too far i will pursue my design you intractable brute and will pack you out of the town forthwith you reject my addresses and drive me to extremities but the innermost cell of a convent shall avenge me of all scene five arnolf agnes alain i don't know how it is master but it seems to me that agnes and the corpse have run away together she is here go and shut her up in my room aside horace will not come here to see her besides it is only for half an hour to alain go and get a carriage for i mean to find her a safe dwelling shut yourself safely in and above all do not take your eyes off her alone perhaps when her mind is buried in solitude she will be disabused of this passion scene six horace arnolf oh i come here plunged in grief heaven monsieur arnolf has decreed my ill fortune by a fatal stroke of extreme justice i am to be torn away from the beauty whom i love my father arrived this very evening i found him alighting close by in a word the reason of his coming with which as i said i was unacquainted is that he has made a match for me without a word of warning he has arrived here to celebrate the nuptials oh feel for my anxiety and judge if a more cruel disappointment could happen to me that enrique whom i asked you about yesterday is the source of all my trouble he has come with my father to complete my ruin it is for his only daughter that i am destined i thought i should have swooned when they first spoke of it not caring to hear more as my father spoke of paying you a visit i hurried here before him my mind full of consternation i pray you be sure not to let him know anything of my engagement which might incense him and try since he has confidence in you to dissuade him from this other match ay to be sure advise him to delay and thus like a friend help me in my passion no fear all my hope is in you it could not be better placed i look on you as my real father tell him that my age <gasps> i see him coming hear the arguments i can supply you with scene seven enrique oronte Grisald, horace arnolf horace and arnolf retire to the back of the stage and whisper together enrique to Crisald. as soon as i saw you before anyone could tell me i should have known you i recognize in your face the features of your lovely sister whom marriage made mine in former days happy should i have been if cruel fate had permitted me to bring back that faithful wife to enjoy with me the great delight of seeing once more after our continual misfortunes all her former friends but since the irresistible power of destiny has forever deprived us of her dear presence let us try to submit and to be content with the only fruit of love which remains to me it concerns you nearly without your consent i should do wrong in wishing to dispose of this pledge the choice of the son of arant is honourable in itself but you must be pleased with this choice as well as i it would argue a poor opinion of my judgment to doubt my approbation of so reasonable a choice arnolf aside to horace ay i will serve you finely beware once more have no uneasiness leaves horace and goes up to embrace oronte ah 
this is indeed a tender embrace how delighted i am to see you i am come here i know what brings you without your telling me you have already heard yes so much the better your son is opposed to this match his heart being pre-engaged he looks on it as a misfortune he has even prayed me to dissuade you from it for my part all the advice i can give you is to exert a father's authority and not allow the marriage to be delayed young people should be managed with a high hand we do them harm by being indulgent horace aside oh the traitor if it is repugnant to him i think we ought not to force him i think my brother will be out of my mind what will he let himself be ruled by his son would you have a father so weak as to be unable to make his son obey him it would be fine indeed to see him at his time of life receiving orders from one who ought to receive them from him no no he is my intimate friend and his honour is my own his word is past and he must keep it let him now display his firmness and control his son's affection you speak well in this match i will answer for my son's obedience Chrysald to arnulf i am indeed surprised at the great eagerness which you show for this marriage and cannot guess what is your motive i know what i am about and speak sensibly yes yes mr arnulf he is that name annoys him he is monsieur de la souche as you were told before it makes no difference Horace aside. What do I hear? Arnulf turning to Horace. Aye, that is the mystery. You can judge as to what it behooved me to do. Horace aside. What a scrape. Scene 8. Enrique, Oront, Chrysald, Horace, Arnulf, Georgette sir if you do not come we shall scarcely be able to hold agnes she is trying all she can to get away i fear she will throw herself out of the window bring her to me for i mean to take her away to horace do not be disturbed continual good fortune makes a man proud every dog has his day as the proverb says horace aside good heaven what misfortune can equal mine was ever a man in such a mess as this arnulf to oront hasten the day of the ceremony i am bent on it and invite myself beforehand that is just my intention scene nine agnes oront enrique arnulf horace chrysald alain georgette arnulf to agnes come hither my beauty whom they cannot hold and who rebels here is your gallant to whom to make amends you may make a sweet and humble curtsy to horace farewell the issue rather thwarts your desires but all lovers are not fortunate horace will you let me be carried off in this manner i scarcely know where i am my sorrow is so great come along chatterbox i shall stay here tell us the meaning of this mystery we are all staring at each other without being able to understand it i shall inform you at a more convenient time till then good-bye where are you going you do not speak to us as you should i have advised you to complete the marriage let horace grumble as much as he likes a but to complete it have you not heard if they have told you all that the lady concerned in this affair is in your house that she is the daughter of enrique and of the lovely angelica who were privately married now what was at the bottom of your talk just now i too was astonished at his proceedings what my sister had a daughter by a secret marriage whose existence was concealed from the whole family and in order that nothing might be discovered 
she was put out to nurse in the country by her husband under a feigned name at that time fortune being against him he was compelled to quit his native land to encounter a thousand various dangers in far distant countries and beyond many seas where his industry has acquired what in his own land he lost through roguery and envy and when he returned to france the first thing he did was to seek out her to whom he had confided the care of his daughter this countrywoman frankly told him that she had committed her to your keeping from the age of four and that she did it because she received money from you and was very poor Arant, transported with joy has even brought this woman hither in short you shall see her here directly to clear up this mystery to every one to arnolf i can almost imagine what is the cause of your grief but fortune is kind to you if it seems so good to you not to be a cuckold your only course is not to marry arnolf going away full of rage and unable to speak <sighs> scene last enrique oront chrysalt agnes horas why does he run away without saying a word ah father you shall know the whole of this surprising mystery accident has done here what your wisdom intended i had engaged myself to this beauty in the sweet bonds of mutual love it is she in a word whom you come to seek and for whose sake i was about to grieve you by my refusal i was sure of it as soon as i saw her my heart has yearned for her ever since ah oh, daughter i am overcome by such tender transports i could be so brother just as well as you but this is hardly the place for it let us go inside and clear up these mysteries let us show our friend some return for all his great pains and thank heaven which orders all for the best end of act five end of the school for wives by moliere translated by henry van laun